Thanks, Bjorn. And um, I've really been looking forward to coming today. I actually grew up just a stone's throw away in Stuyvesant Town, and my dad owned a toy store right across the street from there. So it's always fun to come home. But also because a lot of my work recently in the last decade or so has been on the history of science. And I actually use Google tools all the time when I'm doing that work, and they're extraordinarily helpful. So, it, so it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you today. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. Right? Suppose that you could build the perfect dog. What would be the key ingredients in your recipe? Well, you definitely want cute, right? Maybe something with floppy ears and a curly tail that wags in anticipation whenever you're around. You'd want smart. You'd want loyal. And you definitely want unconditional love. The thing is that you do not need to build this animal. Because for the last 60 years, a dedicated team of Russian geneticists in Siberia have been building it for you. The perfect dog. Except, as you might guess from the title of today's talk, it's not a dog at all. It's a fox, a domesticated fox. They built this in the minus 40 degree winters of Siberia. But more importantly, they built it in the blink of an eye in terms of evolutionary time. A hundredth of the time that I took our ancestors to domesticate wolves into dogs. This is my friend and colleague and co-author Ludmila Trut. Ludmila recently turned 85 years old. And every day, including today, for the last 60 years, she has led what's come to be known as the silver fox domestication experiment. And for the last 10 years or so, I've had the honor of working with her as a historian of science to tell the story of what they have done to as many people as we possibly can. So today, I am going to tell you about domesticated foxes that will melt your hearts and lick your ears, just like this guy did five seconds after they put him into my arms in Siberia. More than that, though, I'm going to tell you about cutting edge work on this process of domestication, which is not something only of interest to biologists. Because if you think about it, when our ancestors began domesticating plants and animals, we dramatically changed our own evolutionary history. We would be very, very different if we had not done that. And this experiment that we're going to talk about is the gold standard for understanding how domestication comes about. So I'm going to try and give you an overview of what they've been doing and why it's important. 60 years. The experiment starts with this fellow, Dmitry Belayev. In the late 1930s, Belayev was an undergraduate student at a place called the Ivanova Agricultural Academy outside of Moscow. And while he was there, he studied genetics. And because it was an agricultural academy, he had all sorts of interactions with domesticated species. When he graduated Ivanova, like every Soviet male of that era, he went and fought in World War II for four years. After that, he came back and landed a position as a research scientist at a place called the Central Research Laboratory for Fur Breeding Animals, also in Moscow. And it was there that Belayev came up with the idea that would eventually become the silver fox domestication experiment. And it started like this. He knew from his interaction with domesticated species, and also from reading Darwin's famous book about domestication, he knew that many domesticated animals share a host suite of characteristics. So they tend to have things like floppy ears 
and curly tails. They also tend to have sort of juvenileized body and facial features compared to their wild ancestors. They tend to have low stress hormone levels. They tend to have all sorts of variation in their coat color. And they also typically have much longer reproductive seasons than their wild ancestors. Not every domesticated animal has every one of those characteristics, but most have many of those characteristics. So much so that that whole thing, the floppy ears, the curly tails, the low stress hormones, all that is referred to today as the domestication syndrome. And Belaya thought about this and he thought, you know, this is really weird because our ancestors domesticated species for all sorts of different reasons. Some, like horses, we domesticated for transportation. Others, we domesticated as food sources. And yet others, like dogs, we domesticated for some combination of protection and companionship. Yet regardless of what we domesticate them for, they tend to have many of the characteristics in the domestication syndrome. Why? And Belayev's hypothesis went like this. The one thing that our ancestors always needed in whatever species they were trying to domesticate was an animal that would not try and bite their heads off. And so he hypothesized that the earliest stages of all animal domestication events involved our ancestors choosing the calmest, tamest, friendliest towards human animals. He further hypothesized that somehow, and he really didn't know how, but somehow all of those other characteristics in the domestication syndrome, longer reproductive periods, juvenileized facial features, all of that was somehow genetically connected to choosing animals based on how friendly they were towards humans. And he decided he would test these ideas in real time using the foxes that he became very familiar with at the Laboratory for Fur Breeding Animals. Because at that laboratory, the two key species they worked with were foxes and mink, because there was so much money associated with fox fur and mink fur. So he decided he would test these ideas in foxes. And the experiment he envisioned was very basic at its core. He imagined testing hundreds of foxes and choosing the calmest ones, the ones that are most friendly towards humans, preferentially breeding them. Then when their pups grow up, test them. Preferentially choose the ones that are friendliest towards humans. Do this generation after generation after generation. Foxes breed once a year, so essentially one year equals one generation. He would do this every generation, and he would see, first of all, was he, in fact, getting inherently calmer, friendlier to human animals and strictly choosing them based on how friendly they were? Did he also begin to see the emergence of other traits in the domestication syndrome? Right? Did they start showing lower stress hormone, hormone levels or other characteristics of the domestication syndrome? This is a classic experiment in evolution and genetics. But Belayev had a problem, and it was a big problem. Because as he came up with this idea in the mid-1940s, it was a time when it was illegal to do modern genetics in the Soviet Union. And the reason that it was illegal was because of this person right here, Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was a fraud, a charlatan, a pseudoscientist who had risen up both in the scientific and political ranks of the Soviet Union. And what Lysenko said was that modern genetics was bourgeois science being promulgated by wreckers and spies from the West. That instead, he argued, a long disproven idea known as Lamarckian inheritance was in fact not only correct, but more in line with Soviet philosophy. He then 
went and made up a bunch of studies that he never did to suggest that he was in fact right. And by doing this, he rose up to become not only one of the most powerful scientists in the Soviet Union, but Stalin's right-hand man on science. So this picture comes from a conference where Lysenko was giving one of these fire-spitting talks calling Western geneticists saboteurs and wreckers. And when he finished, Stalin stood up and yelled out, bravo, comrade Lysenko. Because of Lysenko, thousands of Soviet geneticists lost their jobs. Hundreds were thrown into prison. And about 20 were actually murdered by Lysenko's thugs for doing the crime of modern Western genetics. This is the environment in which Belayev is conceiving an experiment in genetics. Nobody knows better how dangerous this is because one of those 20 people who was murdered by Lysenko was Belayev's older brother, 20 years older, who had been an up and coming star in the field of genetics. But Belayev decided this was too important and he was going to do it. So he initiates a tiny little pilot study. He has a friend who runs a fox farm in Estonia. And there are hundreds of these fox farms around the Soviet Union and their satellites because, again, there's so much money selling fox furs to the West. So he talks to one of his colleagues in Estonia who runs one of these smaller farms, and he says, here's what I want to do. I want to do an experiment where I select the calmest, tamest ones. And it's a small pilot experiment. It involves testing a couple of dozen foxes every year. Test them on how friendly or not they are towards humans. Breathe the ones that are friendliest. And he and his colleagues do this for four or five years, and the results are promising. Even in that short amount of time, they began to see animals that were inherently a little friendlier towards humans. Then get, Belayev gets his big chance to start a full-blown experiment in 1958. What happens is he is offered a position as vice director at a new institute of biology in Siberia in a place called Novosibirsk. And this institute is part of a place that still exists today called Akadem Gordok, or the Academic Village. Basically what happened was in the mid to late 1950s, the Soviet, Soviet uh, political leaders and scientists worked together. And what they did was they cleared out a large chunk of Siberian forest near Novosibirsk. And they built two dozen world-class institutes associated with science. So there was the institute that Belayev was involved in as vice director in biology. There, was, there were institutes in chemistry, physics, early computer science, and so on and so on. They literally brought in tens of thousands of scientists and associated people to build this academic village. So Belayev knows now that as vice director of this new institute of biology there, that he's going to have the power and the money to start a full-blown silver fox domestication experiment. But because of all the administrative stuff he's going to have to do as vice director, what he's not going to have is the time to be the person to lead the experiment on a day-to-day -day basis. So right before he moves to Akadem Gordok, while he's still in Moscow, he goes on a hunt for the perfect young scientist to lead this experiment. And he does this by going to Moscow State University, which is not only one of the best, but one of the most beautiful universities in the world. And he talks to some colleagues he has there, and he lays out the ideas and says he's looking for a young scientist. So one of the people who comes in to interview for the job is 25-year-old Ludmila. The interview happened in 1958. When you talk to her today, it seems as if it happened just yesterday. The first thing that struck her was that Belayev immediately treated her like an equal. So in 1958, Soviet science was very patriarchal. But here was a vice director of an institute talking to a newly minted undergraduate 
and treating them like an equal. And that mattered. So Belayev lays out the idea. We're going to test hundreds of foxes every year. We're going to choose the calmest, most friendly towards human foxes, breed them. We're going to do this generation after generation, see do we get in more calmer and calmer animals, and do we begin to see floppy ears and curly tails and all the stuff in the domestication syndrome. And Ludmila loves the idea. She thinks it's a brilliant experiment, and she also likes the idea of moving to this new scientific oasis in the middle of Siberia. But before she gets too excited, Belayev stops her and says, look, you need to know a couple of things. First of all, even though Lysenko is not as powerful as he used to be, if he decided to make an example of us, he could still throw us into prison. Ludmila knew that. Anyone who studied biology knew that. But it meant something that Belayev stopped her and said, think about this. And the other thing he said was, I've run this little pilot experiment. It's promising. But this is an experiment in evolution. It could take 10 years before we find anything interesting. It could take 20 years. She remembers Belayev saying to her, it could take your whole life. But she was hooked. He liked what he saw. He offered her the position. Six months later, Ludmila, her husband, and their two-year-old daughter hop on a train from Moscow to Siberia, which is no easy train ride, to begin the full-blown experiment. From day one, Ludmila will tell you that her motto comes directly from the wonderful children's book, The Little Prince, where the fox tells the little prince that you become responsible forever for what you have tamed. So Ludmila gets there, and Belayev has money and power, but he still hasn't been able to procure a very large area to build a fox farm right in Akadem Gordok where they could do the experiment. He's working on that. He's planning to do it. But at the start, there is no such place yet. So for the first year or so, Ludmila travels around the Soviet Union to all of the, you know, to many of these fox farms I've told you about. All of them are owned by the government, of course. And she's trying to find the perfect place to start the experiment until they have some place at Akadem Gorodok to move it to. And eventually, she settles on one place known as the Les Noy Fox Farm. It's, about, it's an overnight, about 12-hour train ride from Akadem Gordok. And Ludmila's plan is that she'll go down there four times a year. Some visits will be for a couple of weeks. Other visits will be for a couple of months to start the full-blown experiment. So this place, Les Noy, is gigantic. It's a cash cow for the Soviet government. At any given time, there could be 10,000 foxes at Les Noy, all being bred for pretty fur. And when Ludmila first talked to the director there and said what she wanted to do, he looked at her like she was nuts. Why would anyone want to waste their time trying to build a friendlier fox when there's so much money to be made for the government in fur? But Ludmila said that Belayev sent me, and Belayev's name now carried enough weight that the director said, fine. Test 500 foxes. It's not going to bother me. Go ahead and do it. So she begins the experiment. And it works like this. Every day at 6 o'clock in the morning, she begins. And she works methodically from cage to cage. Each fox is in its own cage. And she's going to score them on how friendly or not they are towards her. And she's going to score every fox twice, once when it's a pup, and then once again when it's an adult. And she's going to score them first as as she approaches the cage, she'll note whether they are friendly or not towards her. Then as she stands by their closed cage, then as she opens up the cage door, and then as she puts something, typically um, a stick or her hand in a very, very thick glove, into the cage. And she is going to score them on a scale of one to four, where four means relatively calm and friendly, and one means relatively not so, either aggressive or running away and hiding. So she scores every one of around four or 500 foxes twice, once when they're a pup, once when they're an adult. And then she takes the 10% that had the 10% of the males and then the 10% of the females who had the highest aggregate score, the friendliest of the foxes, the 10% of the, friend, uh, uh, the 10 percent friendliest foxes. And she does this every year, generation after generation. 
Initially, Ludmilla describes these animals as fire-breathing dragons. They're not technically wild foxes, but they're pretty close to it. And most of them acted the way that you might expect foxes to act, especially if they're in a cage. But even after just two or three generations of selecting the calmest, tamest, friendliest animals. There were a few, and just a few, foxes, like Laska and Kisa. So you're looking at Ludmila holding Laska, which means gentle. These animals were calm enough that Ludmila could hold them in her arms. And so she held hope that if the experiment goes on long enough, they really will be able to find out some fundamental things about this process of domestication. So she goes back year after year after year, four times a year, and does the same thing. In 1965, she comes up with this classification system. She has what she calls class three foxes. And these are animals that are either aggressive towards her or run away. And they never make the top 10%. Then there are foxes like Laska and Kisa that are what she calls class two foxes. These animals can be held, but they don't show any emotional response towards Ludmila. And then there are class one foxes. And these can not only be held, but they display friendly behavior. They wag their tails as Ludmila approaches, and they whine and whimper when she leaves. No training, no teaching, this is what they do. In 1965, class one foxes made up maybe 2% of the foxes. Today, they make up 80% of the foxes. So all of that 10% that are being selected, they're all coming from class one and class two. A year later, Ludmila has to expand this classification system to what she calls the class 1E, or the elite domesticated foxes. So here is a description of those foxes in Ludmila's own words. In the sixth generation, there appeared pups who, that eagerly sought out contact with humans, not only tail wagging, but whining, whimpering, and licking our hands in a dog-like manner. In addition, some of those elite domesticated foxes were not only wagging their tails, they were wagging their curly tails. Wild foxes don't have curly tails, but curly tails are a classic part of the domestication syndrome. It's the first of the domestication syndrome traits to appear in the foxes. Always keeping in mind that the only thing they use to determine who's going to breed is how friendly are they are towards humans. Whether you have a curly tail or not does not affect whether you're selected to breed. Only behavior, and yet still, here's the first of the domestication syndrome traits to appear. So a couple of years go by, 1967, now Lysenko is gone. He's no longer a threat. Plus, this is an important year because this is the year that the fox farm at Akadem Gordok is up and operating. This is what it looks like on a nice day in the Siberian winter. Um, each one of these sheds holds maybe 50 foxes, and at any given time, there could be you know, 700 to 1,000 foxes on the fox farm. And, and this was a watershed moment because it changed the, the dynamics of the experiment in a couple of ways. First of all, it meant that Ludmila and a team now could work with the foxes every day, not just four times a year, even if it is a couple of weeks or a couple of months, every day. The other thing that was really important to Ludmila was that when she was working down in Lesnoy, Belayev was too busy to come visit very often, maybe once or twice a year. But now, he's just 20 minutes away at the Institute. Right? And he can come and interact with the foxes anytime he wants. And just as important, if something major happens, she can immediately get Belayev over to see what's going on. And one of those something important, one of those major things, was this little guy right here, Mehta, or Dream. Dream was the first of the domesticated foxes to have droopy, floppy ears. So here's the deal about foxes and their ears. In the wild, foxes do have floppy ears till they're about six weeks old. And then their ears shoot ramrod straight, the way that you might imagine a fox in the wild. Well, at six weeks, Dream's ears were still floppy. Two months, they were still floppy. Three months, they were still floppy. Four months, they were still floppy. Ludmila calls Belayev out there, 
And Belayev looks at Dream, turns around, and asks Ludmila, what kind of wonder is this? Now, they were seeing yet another trait in the domestication syndrome. Not only curly tails, but floppy ears, all as the result of selection on behavior and behavior alone. Belayev used to take a slide of Mehta to talks. And when he would come back from these talks, by this time they were not only in the Soviet Union, but all around the world. When he would come back, he would tell Ludmila that his colleagues would come up to him after the talk and accuse him of trying to stick a picture of a dog puppy up on the screen <laughs> to convince them that the Fox experiment was working. That's how much Mehta looked like a dog. OK, so the experiment goes on year after year after year. Right? And one of the things that Ludmila and her team have always been doing along the way is taking blood samples so that they can look for changes uh, at the hormonal level. So by 1974, so about 15 generations into the experiment, what they're finding is that their domesticated foxes have about a 50% lower level of stress hormones, corticosteroids, than wild foxes. What's more, by this point, they have started a control line in the experiment. So in the control line, they test the foxes exactly the same. But who gets to mate has nothing to do with how friendly they are towards humans or aggressive they are towards humans. So it's a nice control. When they compare the domesticated foxes to the control, they also find that the domesticated foxes had about 50% lower stress hormone levels. And they were also beginning to see all sorts of other things appear in their foxes by this time. Domesticated pups by the mid-70s open their eyes on average a day earlier than the control foxes or wild foxes. Domesticated pups respond to sounds two days earlier than typical foxes. Females have a slightly extended reproductive season. Typically, wild foxes breed for about 10 days in late January, early February. Domesticated foxes, particularly the elite domesticated foxes, were in breeding state for about 14 days. So a real difference, not dramatic, but a real difference. Yet another one of the traits in the domestication syndrome. It's typical for domesticated species to have longer reproductive periods than their wild ancestors. And even, you also see in domesticated species, um, cases where wild, the wild ancestor breeds once, but the domest domesticated version breeds multiple times. Now they're beginning to see a slightly longer reproductive season in the domesticated females. They were also beginning to see all sorts of strange things in their coat coloration, another trait in the domestication syndrome. In particular, there was this strange white star-shaped pattern that was becoming more common on the foreheads of the elite domesticated foxes. And if any of you are horse fanatics, you know that there are breeds of horses where you see the same thing. And this is not uncommon, this strange star-shaped white pattern on the forehead. It's not uncommon in domesticated species. Now it's in the domesticated foxes, and so on. Many, many more changes by this time. So at this point, they decide that they're going to expand the experiment even further. So they've got this line, the domesticated line, where they choose the 10% that are their friendliest. They have a control line where they choose them regardless of how they behave towards humans. Now, what they're going to do is have a third line where they choose the 10% that are most aggressive towards humans. Not because they're interested in aggression per se, but because they think that having this new part of the experiment will let them understand their domesticated foxes better. And, he, and that can happen in lots of ways. So for example, you could breed the foxes from the domesticated line with those from the aggressive line. And when you study their pups, you can get some hints about underlying genetic change. But I want to focus on another reason that they did this. And that is that this whole experiment that we've been talking about, it's an experiment in behavior, and it's an experiment in genetics. It's an experiment in behavioral genetics. And any time you do an experiment in behavioral genetics, where what you're selecting on is behavior, you're always worried about something. And that is that maybe non-genetic factors are influencing your results. So over these 15 years, we talked about all the things they've been finding in the foxes. And their underlying assumption has been all these things are due to 
changes at the genetic level. But maybe non-genetic factors are playing a role. Classic non-genetic factors might be something like pups learn whether to be friendly or aggressive by watching their parents or other adults. Another classic non-genetic factor would be the hormones that you're exposed to during development might influence whether or not you turn out to be aggressive or calm. And the only way to know whether these non-genetic factors play a role is to design an experiment. This is often referred to as a transplant experiment, sometimes referred to as a common garden experiment, except what we're going to be looking at is a common garden experiment where the garden is the uterus of a pregnant fox. So here's what Ludmila did. She had five or six pairs of females. Okay. Each pair was made up of an aggressive female and a tame, domesticated female. And both females were pregnant. And the transplant that's going to happen happens when they're about one week pregnant. Even though no one had ever tried this in an animal this big, Ludmilla learned the detailed surgical procedure so that she could swap developing embryos from one uterus to another. So here's, the developing, here's a, what the uterine horn of a fox looks like when they're pregnant. And, he, and you can see that they're carrying about five, six or seven developing embryos. What Ludmilla did was she took half of the developing embryos, one week old, from the aggressive fox and moved them over to the uterus of the tame fox and took half of the developing embryos from the tame fox and put them over in the aggressive fox. This is the classic experiment you do to determine whether what you're seeing is due to genetic factors or non-genetic factors. Because what you do is you wait, about eight weeks in this case, till the females give birth. Then when the pups are up and moving around, what you do is you immediately see how they behave towards humans. And you look to see, do they behave like their genetic mother regardless of what uterus they happen to be raised in. If they do, that tells you that the changes you're looking at are genetic. If they behave like their foster mother, then that suggests non-genetic factors might be at play. So Ludmilla sets this up. She's waiting. But of course, she has a little bit of a problem. And the problem is, when she moves the one-week-old developing embryos from one uterus to another, she knows who's who. But how is she going to know who is who when the females give birth? Fortunately, she thought, she thought about this and recognized this problem before she did the transplant. The foxes can provide you the answer to that question because fox coat color is a very well understood genetic trait. That means that Ludmilla could color code the parents. So in some treatments, the, the uh, domesticated female and male had light cut fur color, and the aggressive pair had dark fur color, and, and others vice versa. And she then knew by the coat color of the pups who their genetic parents were. OK, so she's waiting, and she's waiting. And at this point, I just want to take a uh, uh, tell you quickly about another group of people involved in this experiment, the people that Ludmila and all the scientists refer to nicely as the workers. So anytime you have 700 foxes on a farm, someone's got to feed them, change their cages, make sure they're OK. These are the workers. And they tend to, to, they tend to be poor women from local villages. They don't understand the details of this experiment, but they know that what's going on here is really important science. And they often go way above the call of duty to work with Ludmila. And it was the workers who first discovered the females giving birth. They ran to Ludmila's office with cake and wine and had a giant party to celebrate it. So what did they find? I'm going to show you the results from one aggressive female who gave birth to a bunch of pups. Okay. The results are very similar across all females, but I'm going to let Ludmilla, in her own words, tell you what she found. So Ludmilla says, it was fascinating. The aggressive mother had both foster offspring and her genetic offspring. Of course, that is exactly the way Ludmilla set up the experiment. Her foster tame offspring were barely walking. 
But if there was a human standing by, they were already rushing to the cage doors, wagging their tails and also licking her hands. And Ludmilla continues, she, the mother, was punishing her foster tame offspring for such, I love this phrase, improper behavior. She growled at them, grabbed their necks, threw them back into the corner of the cage. And what did those little pups do but get up, walk back over to the cage, and start licking Ludmilla's hand again? They behaved exactly like their genetic mother, not like their foster mother. OK, so Ludmilla continues. Now she's going to look at the genetic offspring of the aggressive mother. What did they do? And again, I adore the way that she describes this. They retain their dignity, growling aggressively the same as their mother and running to their nests. They behave like their genetic mother. This was common for all the pups born to aggressive females, and it was also common to all the pups born to domesticated females. The pups behave like their genetic mother. OK, so the experiment's going on. And, 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 the, and, and what's happening is happening even faster than Ludmila and Belayev dreamed it would. So at this point, Ludmila goes to Belayev with an audacious idea. She says, there is this tiny little house on the experimental fox farm, about 700 square feet or something. I want to move in there with one of the elite domesticated females and live with that individual. 24-7, the way that we live with our dogs. More importantly, the way that our ancestors lived with proto-dogs. And I'm going to take notes on everything that happens. And we can really see just how far down the path of domestication these foxes have come. Yes, it's only a sample size of one. It's an anecdote. But maybe it'll teach us something important. So Belayev says, I love it. And Ludmila has the perfect fox in mind. The fox's name is Pushinka, which means tiny ball of fluff. And from the time that Pushinka was three weeks old and walking around, she was the friendliest of all the elite domesticated foxes in the history of the experiment. And Ludmila knew she was the one. But Ludmila decided she's going to wait a year until Pushinka is ready to breed at one year old. And she breeds Pushinka with a elite male. And now the idea is that she's going to move in with Pushinka right before Pushinka is ready to give birth. So she can take notes, not just on what Pushinka does, but what pups who, from the moment they're born, are interacting with humans the way that we interact with dog pups, how they act. This is the only known picture we have of Pushinka, the lay of petting her. This is what the experimental house looks like today. It still stands, even though this experiment is in the mid-1970s. But if you look inside today, it's pure rubble. Right? And the reason that I'm showing you pure rubble is that the first time that I visited, in January of 2012, it was about minus 35. The snow was about up to here. Ludmila is about up to here. And Nevertheless, at 80 years old, she insisted upon taking me out to the house and giving me a room-by-room -room tour, telling me this is where Pushinka used to lie on the edge of my bed at night. This is where the pups used to play ball, and so on, and so on. So they moved in, and on April 6, Pushinka gave birth to her six pups, including this little guy, Pushak, which is the male version of Tiny Ball of Fluff. And she took notes on everything that they did. So this was April. And they had been living together for about three months, so it's now July. Now, this picture comes from when I was there in the winter. But in the summer, in July, it's really hot in Siberia. It can get to be 90 degrees at night. And so what Ludmila would do every evening is that on the other side of this house, there's a little bench. And she would sit out there reading a book. And like you might with your dog, Pushinka would be lying by her side, and Ludmila would be reading and petting Pushinka. And every evening around 7 PM or so, there was a guard that would come around the fox farm just to make sure everything was OK. And they had hired a new guard that nobody knew. And this guard, on the night of July 15th, was approaching Ludmila and Pushinka in a sort of brisk way that maybe you might interpret as slightly aggressive. 
And Ludmila looked down at Pushinka and she could not believe what was happening. Pushinka had bolted up, charged towards the night watch person and began barking at them exactly the way that a guard dog would and exactly like no fox in the history of the experiment had ever barked. And Ludmila's first thought was, Pushinka's protecting me. But then she stopped and said, wait a minute. I know better than most how dangerous it is to fall into that trap, to think that animals are behaving the way we would in that situation. But then something else happened, which was that Ludmila went over to the watch person and began talking to them in a very calm, serene way. And when Pushinka saw that, she stopped barking, walked back over to the bench, lay down and waiting, waited for Ludmila to come back and start reading. Is it possible Pushinka wasn't protecting Ludmila? Of course it's possible. But what Ludmila wanted to know was just how down, far down the path of domestication these animals had come. And Pushinka told her that. And because you are become responsible forever for what you have tamed, Ludmila will tell you from that night forward, she knew she would never leave the experiment, and she never has. So let me just take five more minutes to quickly run you through some other incredible things that have go gone on in this experiment. I mentioned before that in the 70s, the reproductive season of the elite domesticated animals had, was slightly longer, another trait in the domestication syndrome. In the early 80s, something remarkable happened. In about 84, a handful, maybe four or five, of the elite domesticated foxes were ready to breed twice in a year. Not only in the typical January, February time, but a second time in September. Absolutely unheard of ever in foxes, but typical for domesticated animals. Ludmila bred those handful of elite females with a handful of elite males who would breed with them. They produced a second clutch of pups. Think about how radical the change has to be to your reproductive system to be able to go from breeding just once a year to twice a year, all as the result of selection on behavior and only behavior. By the 80s and 90s, Ludmila was working with people who had very sophisticated equipment that allowed her to measure the faces and bodies of, the anim of her, of her um, domesticated foxes. And what she found was a couple of things. First of all, the domesticated foxes have a rounder, shorter, more dog-like snout. If you think of a fox in the wild, you think of this long, pronounced snout. Domesticated foxes, more dog-like, round, short. Another thing you might think of of domesticated foxes, another thing you might think of of wild foxes is they have these gracile limbs that they're running around on. The domesticated foxes are chunkier and lower to the ground than wild foxes are. So as the experiment progresses and we get into the era of molecular genetics, they begin looking at these questions. And what happened was there was a geneticist by the name of Anna Kukova, a Russian geneticist who had worked with dogs. And she approached Ludmila because now the, the tools for studying genetics in dogs are easily adaptable to foxes. And she says, do you want to do some work trying to understand the underlying molecular genetic changes? And what Anna learned, which is what everybody learns when they work with Ludmila, which is that if she thinks that you can help her better understand her domesticated foxes. She will not only work with you, she will work with you in a way that will make your head spin. And before she knew it, Anna had hundreds of blood samples that allowed them to start doing um, an analysis of the underlying molecular genetic changes that have occurred in their foxes. And they've done this in many, many different ways. I'm just gonna show you one, okay, an early study. So one of the first questions they asked was this. There are all these changes that have happened with the domesticated foxes. Not only they're calmer, but all the, behave, all the morphological changes we talked about, the floppy ears, the curly tails, and so on. The first question was, at a molecular genetic level, are the genetic changes associated with that, are they kind of spread all over the genome of the foxes, or are they localized in sort of hot spots of genetic change associated with the domestication? What they found was many, not all, but many of the changes in their domesticated foxes could be localized to one chromosome, fox chromosome number 12. That's sort of interesting, right? It's not spread all over the genome. It's 
in a hot spot or in one of a couple of hot spots. More interesting was that at the same time they were asking that question, a group of people were asking the same exact question in dogs. So dogs have more chromosomes than foxes, but Fox chromosome number 12 is essentially spread across, bits of it are spread across three dog chromosomes. For anyone who's a biologist, these are homologous chromosomes. But basically, Fox chromosome 12 is divided up into bits of it onto three dog chromosomes. Lo and behold, one of those three dog chromosomes, again, is a hot spot for domestication, changes associated with domestication. So even deep down at the molecular genetic level, it looks like they're mimicking the process that happened with wolves to dogs. OK, last example. I'm going to tell you about one trait that they have only found in the last 15 years. And this may be my favorite of all the traits that domesticated foxes have. But before I tell you what it is, I want to tell you why it's my favorite. And it's a couple of reasons. First of all, this trait did not appear until about 15 years ago. So that means the experiment was going on 45 years before this trait emerged, making it the poster child for why long-term experiments are important. If any one of us had worked 30 years on a given biological system, we would sit back and start getting lifetime achievement awards, and you would not have worked nearly long enough in a system for something like this. The second reason I love this trait is it's hard to imagine a more perfect trait for a domesticated pet-like species to have than this. So here's the story. In about two th the early 2000s, a woman by the name of Svetlana Gogolova approached Ludmila. And Svetlana studies animal communication. And she said, I want to come there, and I, just, I want to study the, the sounds that your foxes make. And I want to study it in the domesticated foxes, the control foxes, and the aggressive foxes, see what we might find. Ludmila said, great. Honest, uh, Svetlana started coming year after year, ended up with 2,000 hours of tapes of the sounds these foxes make. And what she found was, across all the foxes, domesticated, control, and, and, and aggressive, there are about eight different unique sounds they make. Right? Most of those sounds are made by foxes in all the groups, domesticated, control, and aggressive. But there are two, and I'm going to focus on one here, that, is only, that are only made by the domesticated foxes. And the one that we're going to hear in a second, this is only made by domesticated foxes. It's made by almost all of them. And it's made from the, their time, from the time that they start walking around. And this is what it sounds like. <laughs> there is no non-human sound that's closer to human laughter than that sound. If you put it on a spectrogram and look at it and compare it to human laughter, there's no, there's no sound that's closer to human laughter. And it's, it's almost too perfect, right? I mean, now you have an animal that is not only incredibly friendly and incredibly cute, but you have an animal that's going to laugh with you when you're laughing, and it's going to laugh with you when you're angry, and it's going to laugh with you when you're crying because it doesn't care about any of that. But nonetheless, it's making this perfect sound, right? It's just what you'd want to have in a domesticated species. OK, so if you talk to Ludmilla 60 years after she began and continues to work on this experiment, and you ask her about her hopes and the dreams for the future, what you'll get is, well, you'll get a six-hour answer, but I'll give you the quick version. The first thing she'll tell you is, I hope it's possible to register them as a new pet species. So technically, they are considered an exotic species. There are, in fact, a couple of dozen in people's houses across the United States and Europe. But because they're an, and they're very expensive, and all the money goes to the experiment, but because they're an exotic species, the rules about whether you can have one of these vary not just from country to country and from state to state, but from city to city and subdivision to subdivision. Now, there is an international panel that can um, assess whether an animal should be considered a house pet. And they're working to get that classification. Once they do, then the foxes could go into any houses anywhere. And what Lunila envisions is they have plenty of foxes to keep the experiment going and also to put a few hundred into people's houses every year. The other thing 
that Ludmila will tell you about her hopes is one day I'll be gone, but I want my foxes and the experiment to live forever. I do, I hope you do, and I appreciate you guys taking your lunch to hear this talk. Thanks very much. classes you hear about this like nonstop. So I'm curious. Oh really? You hear about this experiment? Oh yeah. I, oh good. Yeah. That's good to know. It's part of the curriculum. Uh, like, I'm wondering when you first heard about it and how you got involved. Well be, you know because my own degree is in evolutionary biology. I, I don't remember exactly when but it must have been in one of my graduate classes because it is a very famous experiment. Um, I got involved in it, um, you know, uh, seriously about 10 years ago when I was looking for a, for a new history of science project. Um, I had done some work on um, Russian evolutionary biology, so I, I knew not only about some of the basics things they found. See, the thing is, a lot of people know a little bit about this experiment because 95% of it is published in Russian. So people know about floppy ears and stuff, but not a lot. So I knew a little bit about the science and I thought, I know this is important science, but I also had a sense that Lysenko was involved. I had a sense that there were some really interesting human animal um, bonding stories and all of that. So I approached Ludmila about it and, and, and she was keen on, on doing something. So it was, I'd say 10 years ago. And it's been great. I mean, Ludmila and that whole group in Novosibirsk have become like family. I mean, um, and she, you know, I just emailed with her the other day, and she's, she's doing fine, and she's still leading the experiment. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the talk. The foxes are adorable. Um, I'm Thank curious you. if they uh, try to uh, control for researchers' bias. Like, would Ludmila mm. favor animals that have the yep. domestication? Yeah. It's a great question, right? And so um, this is an inherent problem in this kind of experiment where you're going to gauge behavior. So I think that over the course of the experiment, they've gotten much better and tighter about this. Initially, like when I talked about that place, Les Noy, it was really Ludmila and Ludmila alone. But once the experiment moved in 1967 to the experimental farm, and there was a whole team of people, they began to do other things that really controlled as much as possible for what you're talking about, okay? So first of all, the, the key thing they do is they've adopted techniques that come from psychology because psychologists have this problem all the time. You're measuring behavior and how do you know you're only using the, what you think you are, maybe you're being affected by other things. The classic way to do this is to have multiple different people independently assess whatever is being looked at and then look for tight correlations across people in terms of who says the animal's friendly and who isn't. And that's what they do now. The other thing that they do is that there's a many, many components of behavior that they're looking for, not just the four things that Ludmila talked about early on. That's still, the core of it is they're still looking for attributes of friendliness towards humans, but they've subdivided that into dozens of different things. So that plus the multiple observers is, is the classic way to handle this problem, and they do the best they can with it. Okay, thank yeah. you. So the same question. Okay, same question, okay. Any, oh, um, oh, yeah, sure. First of all, thanks for the talk. And, You're welcome. Uh, I was wondering, in your words, you said that this happened sort of like on, in the blink of an eye on an evolutionary scale. Is right. that something inherent to foxes or like how quickly they reproduce or to some larger classification of animals? And like if you, if you selected something from like a totally different, not related at all to foxes or wolves, uh, what would happen? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and um, we, we know the answer to some extent because um, on the other side of the farm where the foxes are, are hundreds and hundreds of mink. And for the last 40 years, another person has been running the exact same protocol on mink and um, finding very parallel results. So they're, they're smaller animals, so, so the, 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 they're not quite as dramatic and sexy as what happens in the foxes, but if you choose on behavior and behavior alone, and they've done that both domesticated and aggressive, like with the foxes, you not only get behavioral changes, but you get changes in coat coloration, hormone levels, juvenilized facial patterns, all of that same sort of stuff. I will tell you 
I, that as scary as the aggressive, fo the foxes that have been bred for aggression are, the foxes, that, the, the minks that have been bred for aggression, I, I still have nightmares walking by those cages. I mean, they're, they're demonic. But, um, and, and there's a third experiment that started with their group, but then migrated to one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany, where they're doing essentially the exact same thing in rats. And again, smaller animals, so not as dramatic, but same basic results. Select on behavior, you get not just changes in the behavior, but the morphological, anatomical, hormonal changes. How about in like, like uh, the number of generations? Was it sort of like a similar timeline, or did it take much time? Yeah, I mean, so the mink two breed once a year. Uh, and I, I, I think you know they were beginning to see serious changes within a couple of dozen generations, like the foxes. Now, you have to remember also that this is, I mean, it, it's hard to say anything about sort of the, the, um, the absolute amount of time and how important that is in the domestication process in the wild, only because this is really super intense selection. You know, you're just choosing the top 10%. You know, in evolutionary history, our ancestors would not have been, been doing that kind of thing. And initially, it would have been non unconscious selection, you know, just sort of the ones that came closest were the ones that were friendliest and so on. And then when they started doing consciously, it would not have been to the intensity that we're talking about here. Thank you. Sure. So one thing that you kept bringing up in this presentation is that the specific domesticated behaviors that these foxes uh, acquire are dog-like behaviors. And I know that there is some relationship. I'm not sure how close it is, but are there differences between the two that still persist? And is there, how close are they really after domestication in this form? Well, I guess I can answer that at a couple of different levels. First, they're, they're both canines. Right, so they have an evolu they have a shared evolutionary history, but they, their, their most recent common ancestor was on the order of 12 million years ago. But they're but they're all canines. I use the language of their behavior as very dog-like as a, as a way to sort of put it in context, meaning they lick hands, they wag tails, and so on. Um, in that sense, they are very dog-like. But um, in many, many other ways, they are not. So they are not animals that are inherently gregarious. They don't necessarily, you know, they're, they're not animals that like to live in groups. There are many, many differences between the domesticated foxes and, and, and dogs, but there are a tremendous number of similarities that seem to be due to choosing for this, this pro-social behavior. I mean, um, you know, at the genetic level, you, uh, although the underlying changes, like we talked about, have been similar, they, you know, you couldn't breed them or anything like right. that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I guess I, I don't want to hold up, but I would have also asked how far away are we from speciation? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And the, and the answer is very far, I think. There's no, so the, the, the aggressive foxes and the domesticated foxes can breed perfectly well. They do it all the time to understand the underlying genetics. They've never attempted anything with wild foxes because they're you know, terrified of introducing rabies and all this sort of thing. But there's no reason in the world to think that they wouldn't breed perfectly well right. with wild foxes. So, so, so far, um, there's not reproductive barriers. But again, this is 60 years, which is nothing. If they ran the experiment for another 500 years, would there be differences? Maybe. Even that's a small amount of evolutionary time. But, but you know, we don't know. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, I was wondering what the lifespan of the foxes are and if it changed when they were domesticated. Another good question. So believe it or not, we don't know a tremendous amount about um, the lifespan of wild foxes. Um, people estimated it maybe you know, on average two or three years. Uh, the dem all the foxes on the fox farm can live six, seven years. Now, but in terms of differences, there are no differences between the domesticated animals and the, uh, the domesticated line, the aggressive line, and the control line. So one of the changes has not been longer lifespan. They have slightly more offspring, but, but not longer lifespan, per se. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, of course, this experiment has never run 
for uh, humans. Oh, I'm glad you're going to ask what you're going to ask. Go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, once you dedicate your whole life, I'm sure she had some great observations on humans. I wonder if she ever exchanged any stories with you or any observations. So we, we, we do talk about this a little bit um, in the book. I would, so here's the short version. Um, in the late 70s, Belayev, her mentor and the person who basically, you know, was her go-to person on, 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 this, on this experiment, Belayev hypothesized that human evolution was an example of self-domestication. And the self-domestication idea is this. Instead of some external force choosing the uh, animals that are friendliest or calmest, in self-domestication, that happens by mate choice. So the idea was, in evolutionary history, both males and females would have been more likely to choose calmer, more cooperative mates, right? For all sorts of reasons. First of all, interpersonal aggression would be minimized. And also, things that require cooperation would have been maximized. And the argument then is that by doing that, by selecting the calmest, friendliest animal uh, mates, you are in fact mimicking the process of domestication. It's just self-domestication. This was an idea that Belayev had in the late 70s. Didn't really do a lot with it. Just in the last three months, Richard Rangham, a colleague of mine at Harvard, has an entire book out on human self-domestication. And now there's evidence from all different fields to suggest that we may very well be the product of self-domestication. And the evidence comes in lots of different forms, one of which is that if you compare you, oh, <laughs> if you compare, um, it says wrap up, please. I got it. Okay. Um, uh, uh, I'm ready to stop anytime you guys are. Right? So you have to tell me when to stop. Um, uh, um, uh, so one of the forms is that if you compare us to our closest living relatives, meaning chimpanzees, we tend to show traits that are more in the domestication syndrome than chimpanzees do, right? We show, we, we have longer reproductive periods. We have lower stress hormone levels. We have many juvenileized features compared to chimpanzees. There, and there are many other forms of evidence that to suggest that we have self-domesticated ourselves. Um, I would suggest, if you're interested, the book, Richard's book is called The the Goodness Paradox, and it just came out. It's getting a lot of attention. Um, you could easily find it on Amazon when you search for my book. So there you go. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>